morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles to John and chapter 19. John and chapter 19. I've entitled the message, The Final Act. You know that in life, there are times that what happens appears to be final. And this morning, as we look at the Word of God and, and understand some truths from John chapter 19, I believe this message will help those who are facing obstacles or have faced obstacles, who are facing struggles, and think that it is it. It's the end of the line. It's all going to be over. You see, there are times in life that we view a situation and we think, that's it. There's no coming back from this. There's no recovery from this problem. There's no solution to be seen. And in the Gospel of John, in chapter number 19, we're going to look at the final act of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. There are those who live in this world who are dejected and discouraged and depressed, who are overwhelmed because they feel that there is no hope. That what they're going through, what they're facing, what they've gone through is the final thing. And yet Jesus Christ here in John chapter 19 is going to teach us some things. The situation from God's word will teach us that sometimes what appears to be final isn't truly final. Wouldn't it be comforting to know that that there would be some solution that things that appear to be final aren't really final? Wouldn't that be nice if that were true? Yes or no? It would be, right? Isn't it nice to know because of God's word by the end we'll understand that what appears to be final isn't really final. And we can navigate life with hope, with victory, with assurance and confidence because what appears to be final isn't truly final. This past Monday night, the Denver Broncos were playing the Buffalo Bills. I am not an avid football fan, but I am a football fan. I prefer, at risk of isolating the majority of, or some men in this audience, and some women as well, I prefer NFL over college football, if I have to choose. And I prefer none of the politics inside of any of the sports. I watch a sport just to watch the sport, all right? Can I get an amen on that? Like, just stay in your lane, throw a football, dunk a basketball, hit a tennis ball, I don't care, leave everything else to the side, okay? But this past Monday night... If you were tuned in to the football game or to football itself, you would know, uh, you would know that the, the Broncos won now their third straight victory. And it happened by a fluke of a mistake after the game should have been over. Or what should have been final wasn't truly final. The Denver Broncos had an opportunity to kick a last-second field goal. In fact, four seconds on the clock, if I'm not mistaken, when the kick was to be kicked. And the kicker stepped up with all the pressure that one can face on a national scene, all the weight of the game falling on this one leg of a kicker. Lest you feel badly, they are paid for this. I have high expectations on sports people because they're paid. I'm not paid to kick a football. I can miss. I'm not paid to shoot a basketball. I do miss. But you, you're paid. This is your job. You have one job. Kick a little football through the big uprights. And on Monday night, as the seconds ticked off, he missed. He whiffed it. What he was paid for was not valued at that moment. But you see... What was final wasn't really final. Because of a penalty, and because the Buffalo Bills were caught with 12 men on the field, apparently there are some people who still still care about the rules. And because they were caught with 12 men on the field, after time had expired, Denver was allowed to re-kick the field goal. And guess what happened? He missed it. No, no, he made it. He made it. And they won. Of course, the commentators talk about it and the newscasters and everyone like, oh, look at that. And, and, and uh, um, penalty-prone Buffalo Bills, they've been their own worst enemies. And all to the point of what appeared to be final wasn't really 
final. But my friends, I'm not here to just to preach about football today. That's just a game. In the grand scope of life and scheme of life, who cares? I like football, but who cares? Who cares? But what happens in real life really matters. And I care, and I hope you do, about real life. And I care about what God says about real life. And I care that if God can give to us something that will help us in the real life, not just in a football game, then I care about that. So with that thought that what appears to be final isn't really final, I'd like us to look at at John chapter 19 this morning. We're going to look at a good portion of Scripture. We're going to look at the first 30 verses. If your Bible's open, I'll read, and if you you would, please follow along. Beginning in verse number 1 of John chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus, and he scourged him. He beat him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Now, this robe is significant. Jesus had a purple robe on him. If you were to study things in the Bible, you would discover that in the tabernacle and in the temple, both the veil that covered it was made of red and blue, crimson and blue fabric, and they met with purple in the middle. My friends, understand this. We're going to understand from Scripture that Jesus Christ is the one that will allow us to access God. Without Jesus Christ, we cannot enter into his presence. Not with thanksgiving, not with anything. Jesus is the one way to heaven. And this purple robe, the soldiers who are mocking Jesus Christ, did not contemplate the significance. But my friends, understand this. What happens is not by accident. What happens in your life is not by accident. They put a purple robe on him, verse number three, and said, Hail, king of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate, the ruler then, therefore went again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king, speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was a preparation of the Passover, in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore to them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is in Hebrew which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. Where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garment and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. 
These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon, his, and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had, no, had now received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Let's ask the Lord's blessing this morning. Lord, we come before you and we look for your help today. Lord, as I speak from your word and try to communicate the truths here, I pray that your spirit would help us and touch us. There are needs here today that you need to meet. And Lord, I'm asking that in this time you would meet spiritual needs. Lord, needs in our heart that maybe no one else knows about, but that you know and you care. Lord, guide during these next few moments. May we see your hand at work and may our hearts be encouraged and we be turned towards you. We'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 19 gives to us one account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We can find account also in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John gives to us the one here. And there are many truths that we can find in these 30 verses. I could preach on many different concepts and topics. I could preach on the power of God this morning. And throughout this passage, we will see the, the power of God. I could preach on how God fulfills prophecy. And, and someone said that in this passage, in, this, in John chapter 19, over 27 prophecies are fulfilled. Because what God says always comes true. God is always truthful, and his plan always comes to fruition. I could preach on concern, and I probably will, but not this morning. Throughout this passage, we see concern. Concern from Pilate, and concern from the crowd, and concern from, uh, from Mary, his mother. Concern from John, the disciple. Concern from Jesus. Concern from the thieves. But this morning, with God's help, I want to preach on the final act. When what appears to be final isn't truly final. Now let me jump ahead to the end a little bit. We know, because of John chapter 20, the next chapter, that Jesus Christ is going to rise from the grave. This is the point of Resurrection Sunday or Easter. We know that Jesus does not stay dead. So we know the ending already. I'm like giving you the preview. If you're watching a movie, I've just given you a spoiler. All right, so hang with me. We're going to go through this and see what God is doing through this. But I want to point out how what appeared to be final wasn't really final. Because there are times in life that situations appear to be final. That circumstances appear to be final. There are times in life that, that a job ending appears to be final. In fact, I think one of the greatest travesties and lies of life is when a teacher says, this is your final. Because it may or may not be your final, young person. If you don't pass it, that final ain't final. And just because you finished the final in seventh grade means you now get finals in eighth grade and ninth grade and tenth grade and then college. A final? Really? Now what they mean, they mean by the final for the semester, the final for the day, the final for the... But in life, boy, we feel the finality of things. Notice, first of all, please, that the death of Jesus appeared to be final. First of all, I want to look at, at Pilate in verse number 12. You see, to Pilate, this appeared to be final. In, in, in verse number 12, it tells us that at this point, Pilate sought to release him. The reason that Pilate sought to release Jesus is Pilate is now understanding this is a problem. And if we go forward with this decision, if I allow Jesus to be crucified, there's a finality to that. And Pilate looks at the situation. He looks at Jesus Christ. He has spoken to him. He's now convinced that this man is innocent because Pilate will stand up front and he will say, I find no fault in him. Pilate now believes Jesus is, and he's right, he, he's innocent. But Pilate sees the situation and he's like, time out. This is final. If I give this decree, this is final. I can't let this happen. You see, to Pilate, 
what's happening appears to be final. Pilate was the reigning governor from Rome during this time. They say history tells us that Pilate's time as governor was extremely short-lived. In fact, after this, right around 36 or 37 A.D., within just a few years, perhaps six years, five years, somewhere in there, the calendar sometimes gets a little bit wonky in there, within just a few years, Pilate's going to be removed from his governorship, and shortly after that, he will die. So just a brief snapshot of time, and here Pilate is so concerned. Other passages of Scripture tell us that his wife came to him and said, Pilate, run from this. I had a dream last night. This is not good. And Pilate sees this situation, and he views it to be final. And so he's doing everything he can to release Jesus Christ because he's nervous about the consequences of the finality of his decree. Because to Pilate, this situation appeared to be final. Look in verse number 15. We have the crowd. The crowd says this, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. The crowd here, this mob, is concerned and weary that Jesus will go free. Earlier in John chapter 18, Pilate poses the question, should I release Barabbas, a thief, or Jesus Christ? And the crowd votes, and they declare that they'd rather have Barabbas freed than Jesus Christ. Then John chapter 19 happens. And Pilate comes out and says, I find no fault. And they're nervous that the final act is going to be Jesus going free. Now this same crowd... Many of them, the same people, the week before, had cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. We celebrate that as Palm Sunday. The Bible tells us that people put palm branches on the ground and they put their coats on the ground to honor Jesus Christ. And many of those same people are now crying out for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And they see the finality and they want nothing more to do with Jesus. They want him to leave the scene away with him, crucify him, knowing or believing that once he is crucified, they are done with him. You see, the crowd thought that this was going to be a final act. And not only was Pilate viewing as final, not only was the crowd viewing as final, but the religious leaders, the chief priests, the Pharisees, they were convinced this was going to be final. Throughout this, throughout this account, you find the religious leaders of that time trying to instigate the mob, the crowd, and actively pursuing the death of Jesus Christ. They've had it with the instigator known as Jesus, with the assumed blasphemer known as Jesus. And notice I said assumed blasphemer. They thought he blasphemed when he claimed to be God, but my friends, he didn't because Jesus is God. He is the Son of God. But they couldn't handle it. Jesus had disrupted their religion. He came into to their, to their town square, and up to that point, the religious leaders, they were respected, they were revered. When they walked in, in the market, man, people took notice of the religious leaders, and they noticed, boy, they noticed everything on their robes and little tassels. They gave them great honor. Jesus shows up, and he points them out, and he goes... They're deceiving you. They are leading you down the path of death. They are dead men themselves. They are wolves in sheep clothing. They're lying to you. They're wrong. And the religious leaders did not like their position being threatened. So they were against Jesus. They were the ones that, that wanted to pay 30 pieces of silver to have Jesus betrayed. So now they want this assume blasphemer to be gone they're convinced this is final they're convinced that once jesus is dead their stranglehold on the crowd will remain they were convinced that one, once jesus is gone they can go back to their place of position and authority among the jews and that what they teach will be well respected they got so concerned and so mad because pilate wrote above the head of jesus on the cross the king of the Jews. They wanted him to write, no, no, just put that he said he was the king of the Jews. 
My friends, Jesus is the king of the Jews. The Bible says he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They thought it was final. Not only did Pilate think it was final, not only did the crowd think it was final, not only did the religious leaders think it was final, but the soldiers thought it was final. You find in the passage, I think it's around maybe uh, verse 15 or so. I don't have my notes in the Bible in front of me. Somewhere in there, you're going to find that the soldiers, maybe verse 28, 18 or so, the soldiers begin to part the clothes of Jesus. Now, you know why they're parting their clothes, his clothes? Because they think he doesn't need them again. There's one garment, his vesture, that was woven top to bottom without a seam in it, a very costly garment. And the soldiers didn't want to tear this into pieces because this was, I mean, this was, a, 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 in a sense, a priceless or very expensive piece of clothing. And so for that, at the foot of the cross, they cast lots. They basically placed some dice to find out who gets the garment that Jesus wore. Now, my friends, they didn't do that because they respected Jesus. Well, let's be, let's be frank here. If we could have something that Jesus wore, if that were possible, we would pay for it. I would. I, I know about you. I think you would too. But Jesus wore that. But they were not doing that because they respected Jesus. They did that because they figured once he died, he didn't need any longer. It was final. I wrote a message once on that thought, playing games at the foot of the cross. There are times in life that we play games at the foot of the cross. Jesus has died, has died for our sins, and here we are just playing around with life. And those soldiers there just playing some dice. They thought, they thought this was final. After verse 30, after Jesus cries out, it is finished, the next few verses, the soldiers will go approach the body of Jesus Christ. They will look at him and they will see that he has already passed. He's already dead. And they will not break his legs. They will stick a spear in his side. And they viewed this to be final. You see, Jesus' death appeared to be final. Not only to Pilate, not only to the crowd, not only to the religious leaders, not only to the soldiers, but also to the followers of Jesus. Mary was there, and Mary is mother. The disciples had deserted Jesus Christ. They did in the garden. They all ran. Now, one has come back. The Bible says the one whom Jesus loved, we know from other scriptures, this is the apostle John. And they're there, not in gladness, not knowing John chapter 20, what's going to happen, but they're there in defeat, in sorrow, because even they view this to be final. It appeared to be final. It appears that all hope is gone. And so it appears to everyone, to every observer that day, that this is final. And then Jesus cries out with this phrase in verse number 30. It is finished. My friends, I don't know about you, but that sounds final to me. Doesn't it to you? Jesus' death appeared to be final, but notice number two. Number two, the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus was final. It was final. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, that word there is a powerful word. The word there gives us the, the concept that what was done then has results that will travel on throughout time. What Jesus accomplished on the cross was final, just not like everyone thought it was going to be. You see, there was fear felt that day. There was betrayal demonstrated that day. There was mockery in the trial. There were lies that were told, injustices that were demonstrated, innocence betrayed and killed, and wickedness appeared to triumph. Yet in all of this, God's plan was never hindered. God's plan was never thwarted. My friends, understand this. God can always do what God can do. God's plan was not thwarted. His plan was not hindered. It was never in jeopardy of not succeeding. Betrayal couldn't stop it. Lies couldn't hinder it. Rejection couldn't slow it down. Sorrow didn't phase it. Not even death could finish the plan of God. Yet the death of Jesus Christ was final. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he effectively 
paid for the sins of the world. Everyone who had lived, everyone who will live, Jesus Christ paid the right payment for their sin on the cross. It literally takes nothing else. It was final. It doesn't need anything else. It's all inclusive right there. Jesus on the cross, there's a finality to the payment of sin. And the cry, it is finished, echoes through the portals of time. See, Jesus' death was final in payment for sin. But here's what I want to show us this morning. The death of Jesus wasn't final. You say, Pastor, you're not making any sense today. You're all over the place. Fair enough, just bear with me here. You see, we know, I told you the ending, then came Sunday. Then came Sunday where Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Early Sunday morning, those Mary Magdalene, uh, they go down to the, to the tomb, and, and they go to this tomb to, 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 to help with the body of Jesus Christ, and they go there, and the, and the stone is rolled away, and, and Jesus is not there. Mary's so confused that she sees who she assumes to be a gardener. And she goes, where have you taken the body of Jesus? Remember, because this was all final. But it just appeared to be final. And the gardener, who was actually Jesus Christ, said, Mary. And in that name, in that word, just released the compassion and the power of God. And Mary went to hug Jesus Christ. He said, don't touch me yet. I'm not yet ascended. You see, Jesus was raised from the dead. There are times that things do not turn out like we thought they'd turn out. But they're not failures. It just means they're not final. You see, I want you to remember this this morning. It is finished, but Jesus is not finished. Salvation's finished, but Jesus is not done. This wasn't a final act, but the opening prelude. Now, this is what happens. We find out afterwards. Pilate is dumbfounded. All right, he knows someone's stolen the body of Jesus Christ. The soldiers are fearful. The religious leaders are anxious, and his followers barely believe it. Jesus is not finished yet. Remember Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas sometimes because he can't believe that Jesus is alive. You see, it is finished, but Jesus is not finished yet. He restores. He empowers. He brings victory. You see, when life appears to, to be final, remember this. It is finished, but Jesus is not finished yet. And when we read about the death of Jesus Christ, we can remember the power of the resurrection. I read a story about a man. It was a pastor who was at a jewelry store. And in front of him at the jewelry store was another lady who was buying a cross. The jeweler to the lady said, well, what kind of cross would you like? Would you like the silver cross or the cross with the little man on it? And how we miss the truth that the cross had a man on it. And Jesus cried, it is finished. But Jesus is not finished yet. And here's the second point that I want to end up today and give you just a few minutes, a few thoughts to encourage you. Because Jesus is not finished, it is finished. But you are not finished yet. Because it is finished, you and I are not finished yet. This is a brand new opportunity. Because of this, you and I can have eternal life. It is finished, but we're not finished yet. This, I would argue, is the single most important event in human history. Nothing of greater importance took place in the death of Jesus Christ. Paying for the payment of the sins of the world. Separation from God the Father. And the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Because it is finished, we're not finished yet. I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can share with someone how God loves them. And Jesus died for them. And the point being that because of that, you're not finished. And you can have a gift of eternal life. And you can have a hope in life, an assurance in life. And the time may appear to go to zero. But just because it appears to be finished, you're not finished yet. Sins that I've carried are now able to be forgiven. There are those who think they've done too much wrong in this world that will be forgiven. They've committed too many mistakes. They've lived too rough of a life. But because it is finished, that means I'm not finished yet. 
And there is no sin that is greater than the ability of Jesus Christ to forgive it. There is no error that is too great that God cannot forgive it. You see, Jesus is the destination changing, my friend. He's the bondage breaking, relationship restoring, power enabling Son of God. And He cried, It is finished, so that you and I don't have to be finished. Without Him, we'll be finished. But with Him. You see, because Jesus said it's finished, you and I don't have to be. You may be here today and you may not be saved. You may not have ever accepted the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But you don't have to be finished yet. I read a story about a Christian pastor, I'm sorry, a pastor who was Christian, and his carpenter, who was not. The pastor was a farmer on the side and then and pastor on Sundays. And he was burdened for the carpenter's soul. The carpenter was hard to the gospel, to the, to the gift of Jesus Christ. The carpenter had his whole life with his own hands, with his own hands, found his own success. And many people cling to that in life where I, with my own hands, I've built this. Why do I need Jesus? So the Lord gave the pastor who was a farmer some wisdom. And he asked the carpenter to build him a gate for one of his pastures. Carpenter worked on it at home and just made a very strong and a very well-built gate. He delivered it to the farmer or pastor's house and then left. The next day, the pastor contacted the, the carpenter. The, far, the, the carpenter said, listen, would you come back and see the fence? I have it installed and I've made a few upgrades to it. The carpenter, who knew he was much better with his hands and woodwork than this farmer who also was a pastor was intrigued and a little worried. Went over to the house and to the pasture, and there he found this farmer with a gate installed, and he had an axe in his hand. The carpenter said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, he said, you've given me a very nice gate, but I need to make a few improvements on it. And he took that axe and began to chop the gate into pieces. After a few swings, the carpenter was devastated and, and, and just, what are you doing? And when the pastor got done chopping the gate, he said, my friend, I've told you about the gift of Jesus Christ who is the gate to heaven. And rather than accepting the gate to heaven, you keep on wanting to add some things to it. And when you do that, you're in essence chopping that gate to pieces. You see, because it is finished, you and I don't have to be finished. Jesus Christ paid the right payment for sin. There is nothing I can do except the gift of Jesus Christ. But also, let me challenge those who have accepted the gift of God. You know that sometimes in life, Christian, those who are Christians, those who are believers, that sometimes life still appears to be final? Christian, there are times that in my life and your life we see a situation and we're discouraged. You know, we're, why, you know why we're discouraged? We're discouraged, Christian, because we forget that Jesus Christ makes things that appear to be final, not final. And I wish I could say as a pastor that I never do that. But if I were to say that, I'd be lying this morning. I wish I, I could say that every situation I approach is like, boy, there's a great solution here. But I'd be lying this morning. And I think if you're a Christian, you can identify with me. There are times in life that we forget that what appears to be final is not really final. And I've known Christians who are struggling in, in addictions and habits that God wants to bring victory. And they feel like it's final. Jesus Christ said, it is finished, so you and I don't have to be finished. There are those who have bitterness and anger in their life, and they're like, I can't get a victory over this. Well, you can have victory because what appears to be final doesn't have to be final. Jesus Christ releases us from that. There are those who deal with unforgiveness. There are those who deal with struggles. There are those who deal with regret from bad decisions. They're like, I've just messed up too much. I can't serve God any longer. I can't do this. This is final. And Jesus Christ, his cry echoes through the portals of time. It is finished so that you and I don't have to be finished. And this morning, you may be a believer. You may be here in church or online and thinking, but I can't be used. 
I can't find victory. I can't have that joy that other people seem to have. I don't see answers to prayer because my life, my situations, my circumstances appear to be final. Friend, let me remind you. Sometimes the, top, the, the clock ticks down. And you look at the clock and you think the game is over. But it's not. You find out that Jesus Christ has been holding the clock. And he pauses that and he gives us the chance to have victory. It's a place in Chicago called the Pacific Garden Rescue Mission. They published this account, and the accounts are called Unshackled. Unshackled are real life stories of men and women who are on skid row, who are homeless, those who are former doctors, finance, those who are successful, and those who are broke, all thinking life is final. And all in the Unshackled series, coming to Jesus Christ and being reminded that what appears to be final isn't truly final. A friend this morning, if you're here, and in your mind you think it's final, I'm here to tell you it's not. But it is. What Jesus did for you is final. If you've not accepted it, accept his gift today. It's final. It's all you need. And when you're tempted to be discouraged, when you're tempted to struggle, when you're tempted to not forgive, when you're tempted to not see victory, remember that what appears to be final isn't really final.